Okay, so, so far what we've talked a lot about this semester has been isomers. So when we talk about things that have the same molecular formula, but there's something different about them, right? So we could have two compounds that have the same molecular formula, such as these two. We have an ether and an alcohol then, but they have some different arrangement, and so we would call these constitutional isomers. And last chapter, what we talked about were molecules that actually had the same connectivity as well, but there was something different about their rotation. You can call them rot rotational isomers, or you can call them conformational isomers. And so this chapter, what we're going to talk about are things that have the same connectivity, but something slightly different about how they're arranged with each other. So these two molecules have the same molecular formula. They have the same arrangement. This central carbon atom here has both an ethyl group, a methyl, a hydrogen, and a hydroxyl group. Same thing is true for this particular carbon here, but yet they're clearly not the same. One of them has a methyl group as a wedge. The other one has a methyl group as a dash. And so we call these two then stereochemical isomers. Now, the two most important ideas that we have in thinking about stereochemical isomers are the idea of mirror image and superimposability. And so mirror image, really, you're just going to take the mirror image and flip everything. Superimposability means does it lay directly over the top of something else? So we can look at a couple of different um, examples. We can look at, and this is going to be on your notes on page 52. So if you start by thinking about the letter M, right, and asking whether or not this molecule has some kind of stereochemical isomer to it, we're going to look at mirror image, we're going to look at superimposability, okay? So first thing we can do, we draw this dashed line to indicate a mirror. And so if we were going to think about what a mirror image would look like, you would just copy it right over. Now, if I could take this M and put it right in front of the other one, you would see that there is superimposability too. And so here what we would say is that because the mirror image is superimposable, that this molecule is achiral. It has no chirality. Okay. If I were to come up with another example now, something like... Uh, the letter R, and I said, how about this one? And I could draw its mirror image. Now, if I took that molecule, that letter R, and I put it over the other one, you would see that it is not superimposable, right? So originally, not superimposable. Original. <laughs> But remember that molecules can rotate. And if molecules can rotate, then that R can rotate as well. And we could just turn it around. And now, yes, it is superimposable. And so it is achiral. All right. And so as it's defined on page 52 of your notes, something that is chiral means that its mirror image is not superimposable with itself. And so when we look at molecules, we're going to do the same kind of thing. So if I had an example, say, of these two molecules, I'm not quite sure how well these are going to show up, but they have the same connectivity. You have a carbon that has a red, a white, a green ball, and then nothing on the top. A carbon that has a red, white, and a green ball. You can see that they're mirror images. If I placed a mirror in between, you would look to the right and look to the left and see the exact same thing. But yet, they are non-superimposable. They will not overlap with each other. So I could, for example, line up the red atoms and the blank atoms, and what you would see is that the green and the white don't match up on either side. I could flip it around and say, no, no, I really want the green and the white to match up. So if I could get those two to match, then the red and the blank spot don't match up. So these are non-superimposable mirror images, and therefore this molecule is said to be chiral as well as this one, all right? because the mirror image of it is non-superimposable. Okay. So when we think about chirality in carbon, what we say is that this carbon center must have four different substituents to it in order for this center to be chiral. If a molecule has a chiral center, the entire molecule is itself called chiral as well. So really we're looking at sp3 hybridized carbons, and we want to make sure that they have four different things attached to them. All right. So 
we can think about the example that's listed there. Uh, if we have a carbon and it's tetrahedral in nature, it's sp3 hybridized, and we put on a bromine, a hydroxyl group, a chlorine, and a hydrogen, you can see that that carbon has four different things attached to it. So oftentimes what we'll do is we'll mark it as having a chiral center by throwing an asterisk on there. Okay? If I think about drawing its mirror image, I would draw the reverse of that tetrahedral. The bromine is going to be up. The chlorine is still on the wedge and the dash is still a hydrogen, but it is non-superimposable, okay? So this molecule now is chiral because it has a non-superimposable mirror image. All right, so we can define the way that chirality works with um, a variety of samples trying to define what is the actual relationship between those two isomers, all right? So in this particular case down here, where you have one stereocenter with four different things on it, the relationship between these two molecules here is said to be enantiomeric, or to say that these two molecules are enantiomers, or you can say that one molecule is an enantiomer of another. All right, so these are all different ways to describe the relationship that basically tells you these two molecules have a non-superimposable and they are mirror images of each other. All right, so typically enantiomers, they must have at least one stereocenter. They could have more. They must have at least one stereocenter and that mirror image must be superimposable. There are other examples, especially with things that have larger numbers of stereocenters and the relationship between those. All right, so if we look at these examples now of cyclobutane molecules, all right, so we could have a cyclobutane where we have a bromine sticking up. These are a slightly different representation than what's listed in your notes. And if we were to draw the mirror image of this methyl bromocyclobutane, right? We would put that methyl group down here, that bromine up here. I suspect this three did not show up. All right, so these two then are enantiomers. But you could imagine, in fact, a different connectivity, right? So I could keep that original one. And what if instead I had a molecule where my bromine was on a wedged bond as well as that methyl group? Now they are not mirror images, nor are they superimposable. And so we give these a different terminology and we call that these are sti uh, diastereomers. One is the diastereomer of another. Uh, you could say that they are diastereomeric. You can change that vocabulary any way you want. All right. The last type of relationship that we talk about is one called a mesoisomer. All right, so the example in your notes then has a cyclobutane, 1,2-dimethyl uh, cyclobutane. If I were to draw the mirror image of this, I would see that that mirror image is superimposable. All right, so it is technically a chiral in terms of its molecule because its mirror image is not superimposable. Yet, if you look at this stereocenter, say right here, it's got a methyl group, a hydrogen, it's got a CH2, and it's got a CH. So those are four different types of substituents. And in fact, it is a chiral center. So this is an example of a molecule that has two chiral centers, in fact, but is achiral, all right? So mesoisomer is defined as having a uh, molecule that possesses these chiral centers, but it has this internal plane of symmetry, which you can see if you drew your mirror plane right through the middle of it, such that its mirror image is, is in fact, superimposable, okay? So I think that's probably a good place to stop.